Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 that's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to Nevada Cannabis News Hour. To my left, we have Jennifer Solis, Kurt Ducat, our producer Perry. To my right is... I'm sorry, our producer Beach. To my right is Perry and Larry and uh, Lawrence on the board. Always making us sound good. All right, Raymond. Um, you know, right now we have um, a guest on the line. This is Brett Perjunas from the Libertarian Party of Nevada. Hi, Brett. Hey, Jen. How are you? I'm really good. Um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and the Libertarian Party here in Nevada and what you guys have going on? Sure. So, you know, my background is kind of interesting. Um, never wanted to be involved with politics, but I... Uh, I saw the country heading in a direction. I saw Nevada heading in a direction that I didn't really like, and I figured we need somebody to step up and, and, and fight back for uh, you know for all the everyday average people. And um, I personally got involved about four years ago, and I started on the national level, and I became a member of the Libertarian National Committee. And okay. that's the governing, governing organization for the National Libertarian Party, and there's 18 of us on that board. And, you know, I, it was an eye-opening experience, and I realized that, you know, no matter how hard we tried, it's going to be really hard to do things on a national level. So then, about two years ago, we decided to focus on Nevada. Um, all politics are local. You guys have all heard that before. Sure. But we can affect a lot more uh, of a change here in Nevada or in Clark County or in Washoe County than we can nationally. So now, I mean, people are saying, who's going to run for president in 2016? I say, I don't even know. I don't care who, who's running for assembly, <laughs> you know, who's running for state senate. Because those are the people that we can, uh, work, you know, that we can work with and so hopefully get those that we like, that we feel will help out Nevada. So as far as the party goes, um, I was elected chairman in uh, November 17th on tw- in, uh, 2013. Okay. And the first, the first year that uh, I was elected, we spent a lot of time building a strong foundation and building a platform that we can then grow the party from. Um, unfortunately, it was during an election year, so some of our candidates suffered. But we said, run at your own risk. We, we knew we weren't going to try and win any races in 2014. Everything is about 2016. So our goals are to produce as much value as we can for uh, donors, for members, and get active in the community. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff going on at all times. We're advocates for a lot of different causes. We're uh, your worst enemy for a couple of, <laughs> a couple other causes, uh, stuff that we feel uh, infringe on our, on our freedoms and liberties. We want to go out and fight. Sure. Um, so we have we got a lot of good things going on. We we built a great website that's uh, a, a wealth of knowledge. It's lpnevada.org. It's lpnevada.org. Sure. And, um, we we tell people how they can get involved, and we do the best we can on the blog to try and keep people up to date with what's going on on the local basis. You know, city council, county commission. You know, right now we're working with uh, city council member uh, Bob Beers on a referendum to stop the taxpayer-funded stadium. So we're collecting signatures. We have a very short window to do so. It's registered voters who live within the city limits of Las Vegas. And that line is hard to follow. I mean, you kind of have to go online to see if you even live in the city. Um, it's, it's not really a very congruent district, so you kind of have to look and check that out. But um, that's true. hopeful for them. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we, 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 what we want is we want to see politicians looking out for the people. We want people who we elected to represent us to actually represent us. And, you know, we've talked about this before. You know, we, we're really disappointed with what we see going on with, with the Assembly right now. We had very high expectations, very high hopes um, this legislative session because we felt that we've got a, a good group of people that we can get a lot of good things done. Um, you know, marijuana, we could switch gears to that for a moment. Sure. That was my next I, question, actually. Was it? Yeah. I mean, Right after the election, I was like, this is great. We have a very high likelihood of making something big happen quick. You know, maybe instead of waiting for 2016, 
for the uh, regulate and tax marijuana like alcohol coalition ballot initiative to come up, we might be able to do this now, and we might be able to start saving lives now. <clears throat> and um, I don't have that warm, fuzzy feeling right now uh, just because of all the infighting that I've seen. And I don't know. We'll, Are you we'll talking see. about gonna... within the uh, marijuana community or within the, pol- uh, uh, you know, the political community? No, within the political community. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an outsider looking in when it comes to the uh, to the cannabis community. Of course, I'm active. Of course, we've been you know, pushing for the legalization of marijuana uh, since 1971, since the party was founded. That's an issue that we've never flopped on. That's actually one of the issues that people say that we're the tinfoil hat wearing party because it's crazy. Now it's become a more populous issue, and and people are getting behind that. And all of a sudden, we're not as crazy as, as we once were. But but from a political standpoint. You know, we're in a tough spot. Nevada is going to have a massive, massive, we're not going to, we have a massive deficit right now in our budget. And in lieu of doing a tax hike of $670 million, they keep changing the number, but in lieu of doing a tax hike, hike like that, you know, even if you're kind of against marijuana for moral reasons or religious reasons, we don't really have a choice. If we, if we were to legalize marijuana, we could generate a substantial amount of revenues in a very short time frame and help out the entire state. So Isn't that what just you, happened in Colorado? And Washington. Exactly and talking. Washington. And Washington. Well, we're seeing it all over the country. You know. Yeah, and they lowballed it, too. I mean, the, the first numbers and the projections that they had were so low, and everyone was so excited about that. But the, but the real actual numbers are much higher than what they initially uh, projected. And That's, I'm sure with Nevada... That actually, know, happened, that actually happened up in Carson City. We were asked to give numbers, and the numbers that we gave... We were told that they would scare people, and so they asked us to adjust those numbers so that they would be lower. And I've got those original sheets that we uh, that we gave our lawmakers up in Carson City with those projections. And our second set, our second set was much lower, and that's what they kind of went off of because they didn't want to scare a bunch of people away. As weird as that sounds, I know, huh? Yeah, we okay. I live in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the number one you know, tourist destination in the world. If you made marijuana legal, recreational use on the strip, how crazy would that be? This would, it would increase our tourism. The amount of money just for the novelty of it would be insane. I mean, people are going to Colorado and there's, you know, if, you, if you're into the outdoors, there's a lot of stuff to do if you're into skiing. And obviously it's a great place for that, but to just go party and hang out, what better place than Las Vegas? And I think that there'd be a lot more people that would be attracted just on the novelty alone if you could if it could be like Amsterdam, you know, oh, yeah. people could try marijuana. And the revenues, whatever the numbers are, we're going to trump them <laughs> See if you make it. And it's not just legal. Yeah, recreational use has to be legal. But when they when they set up where the dispensaries are going to be, they have to be smart about it. And it can't be the good old boys network. It's going to have to be, um, you know, wh- what's most accessible. And, and if it's accessible, our numbers are going to be insane. Absolutely insane. Brett, for those that uh, this is Raymond. For those that don't know, what are some of the primary differences with the two major parties? We hear a lot of people that want to get involved in third parties who are just dissatisfied with whether it be the Republicans or the Democrats. What what would lead someone to want to join the Libertarian Party? So let me tell you my story, and, and then I think that's going to resonate with a lot of people. I, I was a pretty staunch conservative constitutionalist Republican most of my life. And my hot button issues have always been the economy, small business, helping small business and helping small business by just getting the government out of the way as much as humanly possible. Sounds um, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I realized is the Republicans would say that they're for small business, but they're not. I mean, all of their elected officials vote the opposite direction. They vote to increase taxes. Um, they're supposed to be the, the, the smaller party, the smaller government party, but I wasn't seeing that. So about eight years ago, I got a little disenfranchised, and I figured, you know, maybe I lived a really sheltered life. Maybe there's more out there that I don't know about. So, I, you know, I reviewed the Democratic Party with, with a fresh set of eyes, and uh, I didn't really like their fiscal policies. Um, I knew I wouldn't be part of the Green Party. Uh, I went to school in Vermont at one of the top environmental schools, and I had my first experience with the, with the Green Party there and on, on fiscal issues and the EPA overreaching. Uh, it, it just it turned me off completely. But then I stumbled across the Libertarian Party, and I read the platform, and guys, I literally got goosebumps. I'm like, this is me. This is me to the T. Social issues, 
I don't care. You live your life however you want to live it. Don't hurt anybody. Don't hurt me and don't expect me to do it. I'm fine with that. Fiscally, let me keep as much money as humanly possible. That's great. And we want the government out of our business, out of our bedroom, and out of our wallet. That's the message of the Libertarian Party. So, unfortunately, I went to my first meeting, and guys, I was really uh, really bent out of shape because I had high hopes and high expectations, and there was a group that was fairly unorganized. Um, they weren't doing anything political in nature, and it was a debate club. I remember so I that. I, I, it was a couple of years ago, I think, uh, that, that I first... Uh, had my introduction to the Libertarian Party, and when I went in there and I saw all the infighting that was going on, it just kind of turned me off. And that's why I was like really so happy when I met you and I started talking to you about what you were doing. It seemed like you were just kind of bringing it all together. Yeah, we had an uphill battle, um, but I, I'm really, really impressed with with our leadership, and I'm really impressed with our members. And um, you know, people know that we have good intentions to build this party out, and. Uh, it's, it's helpful. Uh, we're, we're, we're achieving a lot of success. Um, we've got a long way to go, but we've been able to accomplish a lot. But, but to go back to answer your question about the difference between the parties, we have a fantastic image on our website underneath issues, so alpinavada.org slash issues. And what it is, it's on the left. It talks about the uh, positions that we agree with the left on and the positions that we disagree with the left on. And then on the right, the positions we disagree with and then the positions we agree with and then our own ideas. And you know, legalizing marijuana has been, that's, that's a libertarian idea. I mean, the Democrats have tried to hijack that. You, you can't. I mean, we, we've been preaching this since, again, since the founding of our party. But we have some of our own ideas, too. Um, you know, just in, in addition to legalizing marijuana, it's ending the failed war on drugs. I mean, we spent so much money. And, and candidly, the war on drugs is an issue I flip-flopped on. Because when I was a conservative constitutionalist uh, Republican, I thought the war on drugs was a great thing. We need to do it from a morality standpoint, um, or, I'm sorry, from a moral standpoint, and um, it's a good thing. Well, then, here's how I got to to legalize all drugs. <laughs> but um, the first thing was I looked at the amount of money that we spent on the drug war. I was shocked. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So we can't even afford it. Even if it was working, we can't afford it. Then the second thing is I looked at how much money was being allocated towards marijuana. And I was even more shocked. I'm like, this is a plant you guys are fighting. Are you serious? Now, push that aside. Then I looked at the lives that are being ruined. You know, people who are getting popped with, I'm not even talking a lot. I'm not talking, you know, dump trucks filled with marijuana. We're talking per, almost just about personal use. And they get popped a couple times and they're going to spend 10 years in jail and come out a felon? Yeah. So the burden on the taxpayer is going to be, what, thirty five to 55000 a year, depending on where you live? So three hundred and fifty to five hundred and fifty thousand dollars we're gonna spend to keep somebody locked up, then their life is ruined. When they come out, they're a felon. When they come out of hard times, they're not the same. They can't um, vote. You know, they well, can't you vote. Can't get a decent job. How can't get a job, right? Yeah, they have problems with education. You know, well, I mean, there's an old saying that, you know, jail is what makes people criminals and after you get out of jail and you have these felonies, I mean, what are you supposed to do? You can't go back to your old life. You have no choice but to just kind of fall into what you're left with. And a lot of these people just get frustrated with the system that they've been kind of put into. They call it, you know, victim of circumstance and things like that. Like people go in for a seemingly minor crime and then come out and find themselves disenfranchised with uh, what they had been brought up to believe and kind of ruins their life view. And they take on an alternate view and possibly creating a more dangerous criminal out of that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're absolutely saying. right. <clears throat> you're absolutely. And, and again, I'm not going to call it a mistake because I don't believe it's a mistake, but decisions that people make. Poor regardless choices. of their age. Yeah. Regardless of their age, the consequences are ridiculous. They're absolutely ridiculous. And then we go to the libertarian position or the liberty answer, which is, I don't want the government to tell me what they can, what I can and cannot put in my own body, my body, my choice. And you know, I'll talk to some people who are vehemently against marijuana, but they like, let's say, scotch for all intents and purposes. I said, all right, well, what if I took away your scotch? Well, no, the government would never do that because scotch isn't bad for you. And if it is, it's my own decision. Aha, gotcha. Exactly. So let's say marijuana is bad for us. Let's say that. Who cares? It's my own decision. You know, no one's putting a gun in my head saying I have to, I have to smoke it. Or I have to digest it, or I have to, you know, consume it in, in any form. You're spending, so, you know, you're spending a lot of time protecting people from themselves. Oh God, I wish they'd just stop. I wish they'd just stop. I mean, well, listen, people are going to self-destruct on many different levels throughout their life. Well, like and, I've I've heard um, 
a couple of people say, look, you know, I'd love to join the Libertarian Party, but uh, I don't want to lose my voice in the primary. You know, I don't, lo- I don't want to lose my primary vote. And, uh, or, or, or they'll say things like, well, I don't want to waste my vote on a third party, or I don't want to do this or that. Like, how can we uh, influence change as, you know... Educate people? Yeah, educate people in the Libertarian stance, and how can we, you know, bring this more to a, to a forefront in society is, you know, instead of keeping it on the back burner, like, how can we kind of... No. Yeah, it's not how, just how a Coke we, or Pepsi kind of a kind of situation. So well, that, yeah, how can we, you know, institute change? I mean, is there anything we can do to kind of pressure people to say, hey, you know, we want a third party candidate choice on these ballots or, you, you know, know, I what, thought what that we, we had do? a huge fight with, uh, uh, you know, with Ron Paul. I mean, didn't that almost make it through? Well, he was uh, he, he finally gave up and just went as a Republican. And then there was a big beef a few years ago where a lot of his supporters tried to come in and uh, hijack get him the del- well I, I don't say hijack I say use the system that was put into their advantage I mean they're the ones who wrote the rules and then the Ron Paul supporters came in and utilized those rules to their advantage and then uh, because they utilized those rules the powers that be within the Republican Party decided that they didn't like what was going on so they changed the rules at literally you say the 11th hour at the 11th hour in the 59th minute they changed the rules and disallowed a lot of those that. delegates to uh, to vote and you know basically did what they wanted to do and you know really circumvented a lot of the ideals that they you know say that they uh that they portray so so uh so aggressively and it was really just kind of like a oh my god moment like you know if this can happen here you know what else is really going on behind the scenes and uh that's uh, do what you think that was more of an eye-opener brett for people some people well, here, here's the thing first off um nevada Ron Paul contingent did everything right. They caucused, um, they were organized, they had meetings, they got their people elected to the, to the state central committee. Um, they, they all voted for, for Dr. Paul. Uh, they showed up, they became delegates to the national convention. Um, and if you look at the vote totals, I don't remember what they are. I've seen so many numbers since that time, but it was a lot. I mean, it was overwhelmingly. I, 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 don't hold me to this, but I believe it was like 41 or 43 votes for Dr. Paul, five for Romney, and five for somebody else. It was a landslide. They did everything right. Yep. And then the GOP just spat in their face and changed the rule, like you said, at the 11th hour. Um, and what the rule was is they, they needed additional states to sign up to put him on. And then, to make matters even worse, when they're counting in the, the vote total, they didn't even calculate their, their votes for Dr. Paul. Was, yeah. I think it was Minnesota and Nevada did everything right. Now, when when that happened, if I was a Republican still, I would have been gone, and I would have been made made it known that if this is how my party is going to act, I want nothing to do with it, and I'm going to go find a principled party and go with them. Um, but to answer your question about what we're doing, our goal, like I said, for the last year has been really to build value, um, try and become a viable option for Nevada voters, and. We never really did that before. I mean, we, we, we had debate club meetings, and we met in the yeah. back of, uh, of dive bars, and you know, we ran some candidates just to be on the ballot. Um, we're not doing that this time. But this time, I'm, like, like I said, we've got a great website. The Review Journal says we have the best political website in the state, so we're pretty stoked about that. Oh, great. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of traffic to our site. We're getting a, our voter reg went from 9,000 to 17,000. That's pretty big. Um, wow. Way to go. I think the first thing that we did is we changed the perception of how the political community review, uh, views us. I mean, right, wrong, or indifferent. Listen, guys, I went to school in Vermont. I like to wear, you know, sandals and flip flops and jeans and t-shirts, but not at a political event. You know, it's funny. Exactly. When I left the, Republic, when I left the Republican Party, I threw away all my ties and, and, cut, and grew out my hair. I joined the Libertarian Party. I start wearing ties and I cut off all my hair. But, um, but. We've been working on trying to create the image because, you know, people, they only know what they know about politics from what they see on TV. And we have to emulate that a little bit. But no that doubt. great event, I think some of you guys have been to some of our events. And we, oh, yeah. You know, we oh, absolutely. You guys those events. And well, you fun. know, and the other thing is, is that you're going to help us with uh, some legislative activist training on uh, January 19th, this Monday. Um <laughs> just to kind of help people get informed about what's going on with the the law. But you know what? We need to take a break right now. Um, And it's great talking with you. And we'll be back with some more local news and announcements in our 420 moment afterwards. And if, Brett, if you'd like to continue to stay on the line and join us, uh, then um, we'll be back in a few minutes. Talk to you guys later.
you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card, Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Would you like to work with one of the leading companies in the cannabis industry? Please stop by the Incredibles booth at the Weekend Job Fair. Incredibles is the largest infused chocolate producer in Colorado, and we are expanding to Nevada. We are looking for team members who have experience with high-paced food manufacturing. Food safety training is preferred but not required. We will also be adding extracting technicians and processors to the team. If you're interested in getting involved in one of the fastest growing industries in the country, please bring your resume to the Weekend Job Fair, Sunday, January 25th at the Flamingo Library. For more information, go to www.wecan702.org. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, that sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment. Today we're going to honor Stuart Scott. Stuart Orlando Scott was born July 19, 1965 and just passed this January 4th of this year. He was an American sportscaster and anchor on ESPN, most notably on the network Sports Center, known for his hip-hop, hip-hop style and use of catchphrases like booyah booyah <laughs> hip hop hip hop oh. hip hop hip hop <laughs> so he grew up in north carolina and graduated from unc at chapel hill and he began his career with the various local television stations before joining espn in 1993 uh, although there were already accomplished African-American sportscasters, his blending of hip-hop with sportscasting was unique for television. And by 2008, he was a staple of ESPN's programming and began on ABC as a lead host for the coverage of the NBA. So, well, People might be asking, you know, what does Stuart Scott have to do with uh, marijuana besides the fact that he had cancer and a lot of people relate cancer you know, treatment to our cannabis use. But uh, he actually had a little bit of social media presence concerning, concerning cannabis. Uh, the first thing that people kind of reference to is a a few of the uh, pundits think that Booyah might have been a a slick reference to that, but I don't really think so. I think that might have just been his own thing. But the second thing that they bring up is in January of 13, just after Colorado passed Amendment 64, a fan wrote to Scott on his Twitter account about trying medical marijuana because of its benefits to chemotherapy patients. And he just kind of responded. He's like, oh, you know, haha, I would, but I don't don't live in Colorado, you know, but uh, which is disappointing because he does live, I think he lives in like Connecticut, which is... uh, like they had just legalized dispensaries right when he started to get really, really sick, but they still haven't really gotten that worked out yet. So once again, you know, it sounds, I mean, maybe we're, I don't want to say we're over-exaggerating this because it's a very serious issue, but when these lawmakers continuously uh, delay and delay and delay these medical marijuana establishments from opening, it really does have an, a serious effect on on very sick people who may be curious as to try these alternative treatments. So. You know, you hear these activists, you know, like us up saying, you know, these patients are going to get really sick and die, you know, if you don't open these dispensaries and people kind of brush it off. But this is serious stuff. It is. So, you know, and uh, another little uh, blurb is that when, in May of 2013, a few months after that tweet was issued, uh, uh, Stuart Scott engaged in another fan who told Scott to, quote, go smoke a blunt. <laughs> 
and Stuart Scott said, you know, if I was in Colorado, I would P90X first, and then I would smoke the blind. But then, like, right after that, you know, uh, they had to take it down, or he was asked, I believe, to take it down by ESPN management because, you know, ESPN is owned by the Disney Corporation now, and there's a big, you know, issue with that. So he, they just didn't want the uh, face of ESPN to be promoting that, I guess. You know, it's just one of those things. And then uh, the very last one is uh, Stuart Scott had a Super Bowl. You remember the infamous Super Bowl last year Super between Bowl. Yeah, yeah, between Denver and uh, and Seattle. And uh, he had another tweet that said something to the effect of, uh, what was it? Jokingly, I would smoke weed in Colorado. Yeah, he just said he would smoke weed in Colorado where it was legal. And uh, if he was going to go to a pre-Super Bowl party, he would be totally mellow. And he would bring a lot of chips and dip and like stupid stuff like that. So he's always been jokingly affectionate toward the movement, which is why we choose to honor him today. Because he kind of lost his life to an unfortunate battle with cancer. And we just kind of honor him today and thank so you again mr week, scott booyah. so this week we pay uh, homage to the late great Stuart scott and booyah sir as a side note sure okay you can't tell me mickey mouse don't hit the ganja he's hanging out with a duck Hello. and all them other animals you know he's got to be hitting the ganja <laughs> You can't say that about me. <laughs> and how many of them former Mouseketeers are potheads? Come on now. <laughs> no, doubt. no doubt. Come on now. No doubt. One of my favorite, JT. Oh, Walt my. Disney may have been a uh, consumer in his private life, but the uh, image they want to portray is Wholesome. not as such. So, yeah. I heard that at Disneyland, they actually went and photoshopped all the pictures of Walt Disney out so he doesn't have a cigarette in his hand because they didn't want to make it seem like he was a smoker. Oh, but okay. he was. I know, but it's it's just one of those things, you know. A anyway, I digress. Okay. We digress. And so you got some local news over uh, the yeah. medical marijuana permits. So, um, if you guys uh, are new to legislative tracking, you can go on Nellis uh, and track some bills. Six five seven and six five six are from ten, uh, Senator Tick Seegerbloom. And those have to do with industrial hemp. And the second one, uh, 657, has to do with giving the cities and counties option of a one-time increase in the number of dispensaries allowed in their jurisdictions. The additional dispensary operators would be selected from the pool of applicants who have already sought entry into the field when we started our licensing process. They're not going to have to pay any new state or local fees for the pleasure of getting put back into the pool. The um, unincorporated Clark County allowed 18 dispensaries instead of the 10 that's now approved. And this, uh, this SB or, you know, BDR 657, is it going to effectively allow the county the power to, to land all 18 dispensaries it expected to have under the 2013 state law? So... Does this bill allow uh, new businesses to apply, or does this only apply to people that had previously applied during the last go around or uh, window of opportunity? I think it's the latter because it because while the bill right now or the BDR doesn't have the language in it, the main points of the BDR say that you won't have to uh, you won't have to um, pay any new fees to the state okay. yes, or it's... to the local jurisdiction. It's an extension That's, of the 2014 application process of the people who did apply and just cool. expanding that that year's applications, not anything with the I'm new I'm curious to up. see the language of that industrial hemp bill, too. I wonder whether they'll have any stipulations like, oh, you know, if you have a hemp business, you can't have a marijuana business or vice versa. You know, we saw some of that with the, the laboratory or something yeah, like that. Exactly. Or, you know, we'll see, though. I'm, I'm definitely curious. Well, if, if you would like to track your legislative bills, we do have the class on the 18th um, at our at our corporate office 19th, 19th. oh on the 19th, 19th on, on our Mar corporate office yeah, in honor of martin luther king day and the, one of the one of the greatest freedom founders out there uh we're gonna hold a class at our offices teaching you how to register for the legislative session how to track your bills how to speak the language that these people speak so that you can be more effective and having your voice heard just like martin luther king did my and this Republican. is a nonpartisan event, but the Libertarians are helping us, uh, and Brett will be speaking um, on that. And Raymond, have you got some more on the local news for us? Uh, just a little more on the story that you were talking about. Sure. Uh, local jurisdictions would have the discretion whether 
whether to do the increase or not with the increase in uh, dispensaries that's going to be in that bill, it would not be mandatory. Oh, okay. When picking their dispensaries, cities and counties could use such criteria as location, ties to the community, and diversity. Well, does that mean that uh, other jurisdictions will have the option to seal these new dispensaries from other jurisdictions again? I don't know, but speaking of that, my good friend, County Commission Chairman Steve Sislak, said he's still learning more about the idea and stated that he doesn't know how legislative leadership will respond, but it's a potential solution. While County Commissioner Chris June Kiliani said a Seeger Bloom's idea has potential, but a long-term fix to add clarity to the process in the years ahead is needed. So we need to make sure that, you know, whatever's going to happen in the future, they have outlined. No doubt. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, this this is, it effectively ends the dog fight between the county and the state because, you know, the state said that they picked these eight and the county rejected those eight. And, that, you know, it's, it's. It was, it's just like a legal tangle that maybe the uh, S, uh, BDR 657 um, will help solve we'll for sure. We'll see. Well, rec- records show that state officials have made contradictory remarks about how much weight state officials would give local preferences in ranking the applicants. In public meetings, state officials suggested they would simply move down the list and issue more provisional certificates if applicants lack local improvement. Uh, commissioners try to clarify the process, asking if it could still rely on those statements as expressing the state's intent. But by the time the state responded, state officials said no. The 90-day period in, for, in the law for reviewing application had expired. All right. Well, Perry, do you have anything else for us from, from Nevada? I got a story out of Reno. Sure. <clears throat> There's a reno delivery service that's delivering blood x-rays and groceries but uh not not in the same car kind of a, <laughs> <laughs> nine years ago uh, cole johnson was parking cars at a reno hospital and now a dozen people drive for him uh, him and his partner kyle mcdermott have been building success with their delivery business medical and professional couriers since they bought the company five years ago um, they deliver all kinds of like medical supplies and lab work among hospitals and like processing facilities. They take x-rays to in between, between like, you know, doctors and like a courier, you know, bl- yeah. Yeah, blood samples and, and things like that. And, uh, they're kind of getting into different, uh, little things. Now they're getting into like the re- groceries and they're just really trying to, to branch out constantly. And now they've decided, well, you know, maybe we'll try to get into delivering medical marijuana for some of these new up and coming businesses. So they have gone to the Nevada small business development center and asked them for help. And, uh, they are headquartered at the college of business at the university of Nevada, Reno. You know, they help entrepreneurs with like licensing, finance, regulations, things like that. And they're hoping that with a little bit of guidance from the city of Reno, that they can kind of help to break into this. And I know a lot of people here in town are uh, interested in that also, whether some of these dispensaries will have delivery services attached to them, whether they will outsource mm-hmm. those uh, those responsibilities or whether they'll do it in-house. So, you know, as this story develops, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on it to see whether they will be able to latch onto that and maybe get with a dispensary and get that going. So, um, I mean, that's about it for that. Well, that's interesting. I was just wondering, I mean, if they, would they have to have MME, per, it, you know, The article approval? didn't state, but I'm kind of wondering whether they wanted to kind of, I don't want to say circumvent, but I guess that's what it would be, is circumvent the uh, the licensing process just by outsourcing something like that. Or maybe just the owner would have to be licensed. I, like I said, I just don't know. This is all new new territory so I, mean, I would assume if they're handling cannabis they'd have to be licensed in some way so, yeah for sure well, yeah, they, at minimum they would have to have an agent card i was just going to say yeah if they had a registered agent card from the business perhaps they could get around that but uh, we'll see so we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on that sure so you know what else we have we have our job fair coming up on the 25th at clark county public library 1401 east flamingo 1 to 5 p.m so it's 1.30 to 5 p.m. And we have uh, one of our sponsors has a commercial um, talking about that they will be there. I think it's Incredibles. Yeah, Incredibles Chocolate out of Denver, who is branching out here into Nevada. They're looking for people that have food handling experience. They're the largest chocolate manufacturers in the nation when it comes to cannabis chocolates. And uh, they're looking for people to work at their 
jobs and they're also looking for extraction people so it's fantastic That's so come on out to our job fair with your uh, resume in hand and uh they will be the on-site interviewing um and we expect to to have some of these jobs started soon uh speaking of that we've we've had this you know these job fairs and this is our third one this is our third one in anticipation of some of these businesses opening that just has not happened because of these you know because of these wrangles with the with the state and the lawmakers and stuff like that um so if you have applied you need not apply again um with us but definitely come down to talk to the incredibles people um silver state farms are going to be there also um, yeah, we're going to also have some great speakers too so i mean if you've already applied you don't need to put in extra applications but you can come on down and listen to these speakers they have some really good good points and some things that could help you in your hunt for work and this is all free so um, the other thing that we have are we have that uh, our cookbook. So if you have a recipe that you would like to share, we are going to use this as a fundraising uh, cookbook. And you can look at uh, look us up on Facebook at WeCan702 and follow the links, so, um, share your recipes, and then we will have a cookbook. And remember, all the money we make from our cookbooks and all the donations you give to Weekend goes right to our patients program to get patients that can't afford their medical marijuana cards on their program so they can get their medicine. Thank you. I was about to bring that up, Perry. <clears throat> Sorry, Ray. And last year, how many people did we help? Just over 30. Not bad. Not we bad. helped over 30 people in a year, and that's that's with no cost to oh, them. We'll easily break that this year. Yeah, oh, exactly. yeah. Yeah, because we started in yeah. April, didn't we? Yes, and uh, we do, we have another doctor coming in, um, helping us with that also now. Uh, so things things are going to start to pick up. That's things great. that make you go boo. Oh, Raymond, you got some things that make us go boo. Things that make you go boo. Okay. Over in Washington State, uh, Seattle City Attorney says fold medical marijuana into recreational program. Ugh. Exactly. Ugh. Washington's medical marijuana retailers should fall under the same tight regulations that govern the state's recreational outlets, Seattle City Attorney argued this week. In a policy mem memo, City Attorney Peter Holmes said unregulated medical marijuana shops operate outside the law. Holmes said the city should crack down on the establishment. He supports marijuana lounges where consumers can bring their own can cannabis. Under state regulations, consumers are not allowed to consume marijuana at retail establishment. If your commercial operation lacking a 502 license, that's Initiative 502, it's a felony operation, period. Damn. So this Seattle attorney took it upon himself to tell the voters of Washington State what they need because, after all, they couldn't make an informed decision. <laughs> <laughs> so. all right well that's nothing really <clears throat> new we're getting words from that under uh different jurisdictions like we get that here in nevada too but i think what he's really talking about is he thinks that law enforcement is being confused about what's legal and what's not because uh you know there's like this legal marijuana industry that is taxed and regulated and then there's this medical marijuana industry that kind of operates in this gray area so there's this vast open market still and i think that he's just trying to kind of rein things in a little bit because they still have to deal with these prosecutions this that and the other so he just kind of wants to take the burden off of his office i think by kind of rolling this into each other if he can and just clarifying the law like you remember during last legislative session when we had a very small issue with law enforcement over the number of plants that we were they were going to allow the patients to grow and they're sure. just like well you know we just want to get everything clarified you know, so they're just like, okay, well, how about this? And then they just work that out. But this is a very extreme version of that by just nixing the entire program now. So, once, of course, we'll be watching this as it develops, no doubt. So it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Exactly. <laughs> Something like that. I got, I got a little more news out of Washington, and this is clearly against the law. Thieves, <laughs> thieves rob a Seattle dispensary for $40,000 worth of marijuana. Boo. Yeah, boo. Last Friday, robbers smashed the windows of Seattle's Nature Green Medicine Shop. 
the, uh, then smashed a wall and ultimately stole $40,000 worth of medical marijuana. The alarm system did not activate because the smashed window was 10 feet high and the thieves surpassed the alarm system. Unfortunately, no one witnessed the crime in action and could alert authorities, so the robbers remain at large. So that's a, that's a lot of ganja. Yeah, a lot of ganja. Now, this is a pretty rare occurrence with all the security that we have at, at these places and this and that. And uh, obviously, it took them how long to figure out how to get around the security system, and now they're going to put new stuff in place. So this isn't something that we have to worry about happening all the time because these places are pretty secure. But it is going to happen every now and then, just like a bank. Oh, for sure. I think this is the first time I've heard about a break-in in a medical cannabis shop. And so it's not... Um, it's not a normal thing, that's for sure. But you know what? We're coming up on a break, and we'll have no more news stories from the nation after the break. Stay tuned. Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com would you like to work with one of the leading companies in the cannabis industry? Please stop by the Incredibles booth at the Weekend Job Fair. Incredibles is the largest infused chocolate producer in Colorado, and we are expanding to Nevada. We are looking for team members who have experience with high-paced food manufacturing. Food safety training is preferred but not required. We will also be adding extracting technicians and processors to the team. If you're interested in getting involved in one of the fastest growing industries in the country, please bring your resume to the Weekend Job Fair, Sunday, January 25th at the Flamingo Library. For more information, go to www.wecan702.org. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Welcome back to Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm Raymond Fletcher, along with Jennifer Solis, Kurt Ducat, Beach, Perry Haichu, and Lawrence on the board. We're going to go with a national story here. Starting off, our Senate drug warriors want answers on Obama administration's marijuana policy. Two of the Senate's most ardent drug warriors are demanding answers from the Obama administration about its approach to marijuana legalization in a growing number of states. Democratic Senator from California, Dianne Feinstein, and Republican Senator, Senator out of Iowa, Charles Grassley, both have sent letters to the Secretary of State John Kerry and Attorney General Eric Holder requesting explanations of how their departments are responding to the lifting of marijuana pro prohibition in four states and the nation's capital. Grassley stated in a press release, the administration should account for remarks and policies that send a message of tolerance for illegal drugs. The senators are concerned that the Obama administration's mostly hands-off approach to state legalization, listing eight guidelines that, if, by, if abided by, will prevent federal enforcement actions. That's the Holder memo. Yes. This amounts to a violation of international drug control treaties, which the U.S. is a party of. They are also unhappy with comments an assistant secretary of state recently made calling for a, quote, flexible interpretation, end quote, of those treaties with regard to tolerating drug policy reforms in other countries. I don't like it when senators 
invoke United Nations policy when dictating domestic issues. That's pretty scary. That's very one, one world, world order. order. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't like that kind of crap. And we've we fund the United Nations mostly. Yes, we do. And, and uh, we they, wrote that. Located? We well, we wrote that charter back in the day. At least we helped to write it. And it's just, I, I'm, I'm not having it. And your haters gonna hate. And where, 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 where are they located? The New UN? York City, right? New, New York, York City. City. Exactly. New York City. All right, right, right quick. In the letter to Kerry, the senators write that the administration's actions, quote, are you ready for this? Yeah. Weaken the United States standing as an international leader on drug control issues. End Good. Quote. No, great. That's fantastic. I want our, I don't want us to be a leader on drug control issues. I want us to be a leader on issues that we should be leading on. How like about human making, trafficking? Like making the world a better place, not forcing people to bend to our 1930s corrupt racist will. That's hey, crazy. I, I, I just think the U.S. was weakened enough when Obama was too busy watching football and couldn't fly his over the pond to France. Oh, <laughs> Going on with the story, Jed. Oh, my God. Totally. Um, Fine, yeah, Sunny Grassley it. also say that it's put the United States in a difficult position of defending its compliance with these treaties. Oh, well, yeah. write new treaties, don't you? I mean, oh, no, like, absolutely. Oh, this is this. true. No, this is true. It does compromise our position, and I understand where they're coming from, but like you said, the 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 answer is not to just roll over to those old treaties the issue the problem or not the problem but the answer is to uh, address these problems head on and just talk to these countries be like look you know this stuff is outdated and we need to rewrite some of this stuff i mean that happens know, all the time this isn't the uh, the holy doctrine of catholic law you know this stuff can be changed well you they know? they've asked holder to provide by no later than february 15th a plan to compile information on the impact of legalization um they want to disaggregate by state and comparable over time so that data of before and after legalization of marijuana can be compared. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's statements of, of, you know, basically saying that no one at the Department of Justice has initiated a centralized effort to measure all overall effect of these laws by systematically <laughs> compiled data. That's have, true, too. Well, I have a story right here. That's OK. The government doesn't need to because the state governments are doing it for them. We're so what compiling do you got? data on their behalf. Here's a story out of Colorado to where it says Colorado marijuana arrests are down 84 percent since 2010 as employment rates reach six year high. This wow. was written on January 8th. Uh, when marijuana becomes legal in a state, it naturally becomes a little more dif difficult to get arrested for holding drugs or smoking weed. Now, of course, this means no jail for smoking weed. In 2010, Colorado authorities made 9,022 marijuana possession arrests. Fast forward to 2014, and that number dropped to a projected... 1,464. Wow. Wow. And so comparatively, also, the money that they've lost from making those arrests and, and those tickets and stuff like that have been gained in the taxes that right. they've gained from the... It's not just the smokers benefiting also, though. Yep. Arrests related to growing and selling cannabis have declined 90% since 2010. Now, the second point of this is more Mary Jane Mo jobs. Yep. As noted earlier, 16,000 people received licenses to work in weed stores in 2014 as Colorado's unemployment rate reaches a six-year low. Now, what that equates to is tax dollars, $40.9 million in tax revenue from January to October in 2014. Factoring in November and December, that, that number is will probably eclipse $50 million, and it does not include medical numbers. Wow. Also, tra traffic fatalities are down 3% from last year. $8 million in tax revenue has gone directly toward youth prevention and education. Yeah. And weed has also caused a natural reduction in total drug arrest rates, which declined by 41% in the last two years. And that's partially because marijuana is no longer really a, quote, illicit drug, end quote, in Colorado that results in arrest. And when weed is legal, why bother with the harder stuff? Now, the only downside to legalization... Project Sam, which is marijuana's biggest hater and ironic activist, points out in its own report that public consumption arrests have risen from 184 arrests in 2013 to 668 public consumption arrests in 2014. But that argument is a lame comical duck. People in Colorado or visiting the state can't legally consume or congregate outside the comfort of their own homes. Thus, public consumption, an issue that the state has made a point of addressing this year, naturally rose as did citations. And if a little smoke in the air is the worst consequence of legalization, we can live with that for sure. And this oh, yeah. is why we need to deal with cons consumption clubs, you know, places like the That's Bluebird exactly Cafe we right. used to have. This is a totally easily resolved issue. So I want to go back to those two senators right Sure, quick. Feinstein and Grassley. This is what they're saying to me. 
these are patients that have tried every legal medical method available to them. And what they are essentially saying is screw you, you have cancer, I don't care. Screw you, you have HIV AIDS, I don't care. Screw you, you have PTSD, I don't care. Basically, they are saying screw you to the patients that have tried everything under the sun before risking well, their livelihoods and Feinstein, everything. Feinstein is, he has a history of actively campaigning against uh, marijuana in her own home state. In 2010, the ballot initiative that would be the uh, in California, that would have made California the first state to legalize marijuana, she actively campaigned against it, and it failed narrowly with 46.5 percent of the vote so she has actively been a hater from day one well maybe it's time to actively campaign against her let's find one of these libertarians she that Brent's talking about politician in california oh, yeah. diane feinstein is is entrenched and getting some of these entrenched uh what you what did you say racist uh old view well it's just one out. of these that you know even in the red wave last year, California remained pretty pretty mellow. Their governor didn't get voted out, and you know a couple other things. I mean, they they keep doing what they're going to do, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens in California. I just really really hope they can get it together before their next ballot initiative comes. Well, we'll first, see. don't they, don't they have to like uh, don't they have to you know bring all of the mis municipalities together under a unified state uh, initiative for cannabis? Uh, I mean, they don't have a medical marijuana state um, rules. Oh, it's I know. And that's it's what, by municipality, by municipality. That's why the feds continue to go in and cause trouble. But uh, I, have a, sure. I have a story. What do you got? I got a story from Alaska. Uh, Alaska law enforcement is still untangling the new frontier of legal marijuana. For anyone working in Alaska law enforcement, February 24th should definitely be circled on your calendar because that's the day that recreational marijuana use becomes legal. And mm -hmm. officials still have no idea how that's going to play out for their state agencies with less than you know barely a month and a half remaining there's no shortage of an, uh, of unanswered questions like uh anchorage police department chief mark muse says that we're totally flying but he didn't say we're totally he said we're flying by the seat of our pants and that's really true uh, they really have no idea what they're doing up there they had no break-in period in alaska there was no medical marijuana dispensaries or elite you know there's no weed maps up there uh you, you go up there and it's just totally raw uh and they're going from zero to a hundred wow. real fast. Yeah. And they've kind of put themselves in this situation because they put the, you know, they put the lid on these dispensaries in this semi-legal uh, operation for so long, similar to how we had it here in Nevada, where we had medical marijuana for over a decade and no access. It's Correct. the same story up there. And so now they're like, well, now what do we have to do? And we're now, what are we, we going to do? And they're just going to have to figure it out as they go along. You know, public consumption is at their t list of the top concerns, just like Colorado, just like everywhere else. Uh, it says right now it's going to be a hundred dollar fine if you get caught smoking grass in public, but what is the definition of public? What will the actual fine be? None of these things are sussed out. Are, they haven't done yeah, anything. None of these things are are taken uh, are finalized yet. With and it's coming real close. Well, you know, Alaska has some uh, some more news. You know, Charlo Green, uh, yeah, sure the Alaska the Alaska Cannabis Club. She's been evicted from the property. That this um, is the lady that went online and said "f my job" or yep, whatever yep. on yeah. live TV. Okay, so on live TV, her Alaska Cannabis Club has now been evicted from her own building that she was promoting on that famous newscast. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's basically because uh, she pr failed to provide insurance for the Alaska Cannabis Club, and she's saying that her landlord is interfered with their attempts to uh, secure insurance. And oh, so, I would believe that, absolutely. That's a very protectionist state, and they're definitely... Uh, she didn't make any friends no, you know, she up didn't. there doing that. Um, I, I just don't know what to say. I, I, I wish the best for her. I really do. Well, but, speaking uh, of making friends, if you'd like to make friends in the cannabis community and come on out to our parties, we hold monthly potlucks. We have, um, we have you know, big parties. I think we're going to do something for like St. Patrick's Day. You can go www.meetup.com forward slash weekend 702. It's free to join. We have our legislative activist training class Monday the 19th 1771 East Flamingo. Our job fair January 25th at Clark County Library from 1.30 to 5. And we're coming up on our radio show anniversary. We will be one year on the radio. So you guys, 
Stick with us for more exciting news. And until next time, be safe, Nevada. See you next week. <laughs>